Hey, Deb, is this on? Hello? Hello? Is it on? Hey, I was just going to remind everybody that you can, it's not too late to join us for our, The Chosen if you want to. Um, it starts at 4 30. And um, it goes to 6 30. And um, we had a great first week last week, so I'm hoping anybody wants to join us. Um, like I said, and you get supper, so hey. And, and Mom also wanted me to remind everybody that it's first Wednesdays and don't forget your crowd will shout and crucify. Good of calm from these lips of mine. Dirty shame, Dirty shame is killing me. It would, take it would take a miracle to wash me clean. you're looking for a home church welcome home welcome everyone online and everyone that's here and uh, we pray that everyone is safe that couldn't make it today um, we had some earlier announcements if you weren't here um, Deb reminded people that the chosen Bible store Bible study is tonight at 430 and also that first Wednesdays is this Wednesday uh, so Martha always puts a plug in for cookies. I always wonder, does she eat some of those? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> anyway, so, okay. Well, if you're able, please stand and join us in our gathering song, I Am New.
You're glad you're made new in him? Mm. Amen. Please remain standing for our morning hymn, At Last, and Did My Savior Bleed. Join me in our call to worship. Holy God, mighty and immortal, you are beyond our knowing, yet we see your glory in the face of Jesus Christ, whose compassion illuminates the world and provides us with a glimpse of eternity. Transform, Transform us into the likeness of the love of Christ, who renewed our humanity so that we may share in his divinity. The same Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you to our worship team. And as they sit down, I'm going to give you the reading of Psalms this morning. This morning, we are going to be reading Psalm 99. The Lord is King. Let the nations tremble. He sits on his throne between the cherubim. Let the whole earth quake. The Lord sits in majesty in Jerusalem, exalted above all the nations. Let them praise your great and awesome name. Your name is holy, mighty king, lover of justice. You have established fairness. You have acted with justice and righteousness throughout Israel. Exalt the Lord our God. Bow low before his feet, for he is holy. Moses and Aaron were among his priests. Samuel also called on his name. They cried to the Lord for help, and he answered them. He spoke to Israel from the pillar of cloud, and they followed the laws and decrees he gave them. Our Lord, our God, you answered them. You were a forgiving God to them, but you punished them when they went wrong. Exalt the Lord our God. And worship at his holy mountain in Jerusalem, for the Lord our God is holy. Amen. Come to our time of praying together. Good to see you. Those of you worshiping with us online, if you have a prayer request, you can put it in the comments. And we are glad to pray for you this week. Hi, Pat. I'd like to ask for prayer for 
the Ukraine situation, especially the Christians. Um, yeah, so be with our brothers and sisters. Last night, <clears throat> excuse me, last night, uh, Anissa's husband had a birthday party for Marion's Pizza in, Pick in Troy. She looks really good, but she, she's not taking any more, um, yeah, what is it, mm -hmm. treatment, because it's not doing her any good, and it was making her sick really bad. And uh, <clears throat> they, she's filling up with a lot of fluid, but it's not good fluid. And they can't drain it off because if they do, they'd puncture a lung, and that wouldn't help either. So she said, I'm in the good Lord's hands, whatever. Whatever I got, I have. But she did look really good. Lisa caught me before we started, so that way she didn't have to say it out loud. I um, just wanted to thank everybody for their prayers for Randy. Uh, CAT scan and results were good. Um, and the birth of another grandchild, uh, Tuesday, Emmett Asher, 8 pounds, 13 ounces on Tuesday. How about that? So Emmett was a 222-22 baby, wasn't he? <laughs> oh, wow, I never even thought of twins. Who said that? That's so wrong. Wish that on somebody. Um, two people I, I'd like for you to pray for. One is Ray Quay. He's a friend of Orvin Mine, and he, um, he's in the hospital. And um, also remember Todd Harbor. Uh, he's going through chemo now and has to be there just about every day. Well, he's radiation and then follow up with chemo. But um, there's a lot of running back and forth. And uh, just keep him in your prayers in the family. Anybody else this morning? It's quiet. Blaine? I, I want to second Pat's concern about Ukraine, and I'm, my concern is bigger. Uh, the world is uh, maybe at a crossroads, and uh, I pray for Ukraine, I pray for the United States, and I pray for the world. Amen to that. I'm struggling with the end game because usually there's a clear purpose. I don't see one. I'm trying to understand. Our son Mark's best friend, Brian Filippini, was flying a small plane this week and it crashed, and he and another man were killed. So Mark is devastated and actually went out to the crash site, which was about 30 miles from where he lives. So I'd like prayers for Brian and the other man and everyone that loves them. You still have one, Blaine? Blaine? Nope. Blaine. I want prayers for all the missionaries, Christian missionaries all over the world that are sacrificing and giving their lives for Jesus. Yeah, Ukraine has a, for its location, it has an unusually large Christian population. And a lot of that is due to missionaries. Um, I know Maplewood has uh, Jane Russell Jane was, grew up there, uh, left college, and went and has been in the Ukraine for at least 40 years, on and off. Um, and uh, so she's been a missionary right there. Her husband and uh, her and her husband just got married. Um, they have been, they were trying to get back in, but there was no allowance back in, and now they may not ever get back in. Uh, I'd like prayers for Barb. Uh, she's still suffering. Her her pain is better, but the strength in her leg is so weak that uh, after we've seen the one doctor this week, a week from 
tomorrow we go down and see the surgeon and see what he has to say. Keep praying for Barb. I'd like to ask for continued recovery for my nephew-in-law, Patrick Stifler. Um, he had neck surgery. They fused a couple of vertebrae. He's been in a lot of pain for several years, so they're in hopes that that will give him relief. Bless you. <laughs> Anybody else this morning? Let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning. Gracious and loving God, you have created all things, even the frozen, glistening fields and trees this morning. You've given us the, the change of seasons that we would come to recognize that there are a t time for things to die and a time for renewal in new life. You typically place this season in that, in that space. And God, with this coming of new life, we're reminded of so many things. You called us to a relationship with you. You called us to be adopted heirs, sons and daughters, because of Jesus. It is your son, Jesus, that gives us hope. It is your son, Jesus, and his work on the cross that makes it possible for us to have a relationship with you in which we get to talk with you speak with you, ask of you. And this is where we are. This morning, you've been listening to us. You've heard our voices, the ones out loud, and even the ones that we think are not out loud. You've heard us as we asked for your healing for Anissa, and that treatment is no longer doing its job, and that she may be faced with what comes. And God, we pray that you would continue to um, allow her peace and comfort as she transitions basically from this life to the next one. And God, we know that you are with Todd and his coming radiation and chemotherapy after that. And we pray for your healing and for your help. Pray for Mark's friend and their, his family in the passing, and especially even for Mark, in their grief, in their hurt, and in their disbelief. Provide in them uh, loved ones who will strengthen and comfort them. You've heard us as we continue to ask for prayers for Barb. Your daughter is in pain, and even though the pain's better, the strength is now gone, and the hurt continues. We pray for Patrick and his neck and vertebrae and the fusing of those vertebrae and how this could hopefully possibly bring him some relief and some pain from pain. <laughs> and God, you're aware of what he needs. You have been looking over Randy and the CAT scan comes back good and hopefully he is on a healing track and trend and doing well. And new life brought into the world in Emmett. Thankful for new and young and vibrant lives being brought into the world. And God, even in the midst of all of our praise and even all of our selfish needs, there are greater needs around the world. You are obviously in control. You have seen the beginning from the end. Your son Jesus even told us there would be wars and threats of wars and that for us to not panic. But you have a lot more horrible stuff to come before we get to our paradise. But in the meantime, there are innocent lives in the Ukraine. There are innocent lives across the world and they need your help. 
They need your guidance. They need your direction. They need your protection. And God, we pray that uh, fewer and fewer innocent lives would have to end because of man's greed and lust for power. And we pray that you would find those missionaries who are all over the the gospel, that they would come forward and be seen and be heard, and that your message of renewal and faith and hope in Jesus Christ gets stronger and stronger and stronger. You've given us this position and this purpose and this power. May we not use it for the furtherance of fear and hatred, but may we use it for love and truth to be spoken. God, heal your land. Reach your people. And may they hear the voice of your son, Jesus, who laid down his life for them, that this life would be but a small, small blip, and that our eternity and our hope and our peace would be found in you, not in each of us, not in one another, not in money, not in things, only Jesus. God, this Jesus of yours, his, your son died for us. He showed us what it's like to lay down his, your life for someone that you love, and in doing so, provided for us the means by which we would be saved. May we pay attention to him. May we hear his voice. God, there's so many things that we could have asked for, so many additional things. And in this moment of silence, we want to address you directly one-on-one. -on -one. Lord, hear our prayers. Hear the confessions of our hearts. Hear us as we dive into this relationship with you. Hear us as we understand our weaknesses and ask you for strength. And hear us as we bear our hearts before you, asking to be renewed, transformed, made into something different that you might be seen and heard in our lives. God, it is Jesus who makes it all worth it. He's the example of love. He's the example of inclusion, friendship, peace. He is all of the things that we wish we were. And hopefully with his strength we can become. It is this Jesus who taught us how we should pray to you. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us of our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. This morning, I am going to be sharing with you a passage from 2 Corinthians. We're going to be going from 3.12 to 4.2, because there's a little bit included. You're welcome to stand if you'd like to stand for the reading of Scripture. You can sit too, though, because he, he, you can still hear him when you're sitting down. It's okay. <laughs> I don't know why I don't do that. I can't read when it's up close with the lights. Since this new way gives us such confidence, we can be very bold. We are not like Moses who put a veil over his face so the people of Israel would not see the glory, even though it was destined to fade anyway. But the people's minds were hardened, and to this day, whenever the old covenant is being read, the same veil covers their minds so they cannot understand the truth. 
And this veil can be removed only by believing in Christ. Yes, even today when they read Moses' writings, their hearts are covered with that veil and they do not understand. But whenever someone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. For the Lord is the Spirit. And wherever the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And so all of us have had that veil removed, can see and reflect the glory of the Lord. And the Lord, who is the Spirit, makes us more and more like Him as we are changed into His glorious image. Therefore, since God, in His mercy, has given us this new way, we never give up. We reject all shameful deeds and underhanded methods. We do not try to trick anyone or distort the Word of God. We tell the truth before God, and all who are honest know this. This is God's Word for God's people. You may be seated. Well, how was your week? I see. Dark <laughs> for some, right? I was talking with Larry in the, the story was of Tuesday night. We had just left here, and I was headed up 24, and I see this big ball of flashing light in the sky. And I'm like, well, that was weird. And as I'm driving down 24, I then start to realize, wait a minute, there's no lights on out here. And I got about to, uh, to Dave and, and Nancy's house, and uh, I saw another flash of light, and then the lights came back on for a second, and then they went back off. I was like, oh, that doesn't look good at all. So it was a little bit dark for a little bit, right? We made it. Fought through that. Whatever our ups and downs were this week, we, we followed through, right? We had it, maybe for a little bit, but we got it. Whatever it was, whatever you're good, whatever you're bad, whatever you're in between, I hope— that you remembered what it feels like to, to remain on mission. In other words, as believers in Christ, it is us who bear the light of Christ to the world. And so for us, how are we doing? We can say, how was my worship this week? How was my reflection? What did my prayer life look like? Did I have time to study? How was I serving somebody else? That's how we know how we're doing, right? I won't make the mistake I made earlier in saying September, but all of February, don't ask, it was, it was a strange morning. September, I have no idea where September came from. It just blurted out of my mouth. A long ways away from September right now, right? February, so far, we spent most of the month learning and deciding and finding the power in the resurrection and what it means Today is Transfiguration Sunday, and so it kind of culminates in starting us and kicking us off into the season of Lent, which comes Wednesday. So if you want an Ash Wednesday service, 6 o'clock in Maplewood, 7.30 here in DeGraff, right? You got our options. That will kick off our season of Lent. We'll have 40 days, 47 if you count the Sundays, 40 days of reflecting and remembering and realizing the power in Jesus. So why did I read 2 Corinthians if we're talking about the Transfiguration Sunday today, right? Normally, I'm going to read to you from Luke 9, where Jesus takes Paul, or Paul, I read Paul. See, I'm doing it again. Jesus takes Peter, James, and John, and he takes them up the mountain. He takes them up there to pray. And we see something happen that we forgot about, but we'll see it again later in the Garden of Gethsemane, and that is the, the, the disciples he took fell asleep, didn't they? And so while they're asleep, Jesus has this incredible transfigurating moment where he becomes his soon-to-be image, his forever eternal image, and what appears to be translated to uh, what they thought were Moses and Elijah are there with him. Peter wakes up in the middle of this and thinks to himself, Oh my goodness, what am I witnessing? This is incredible. This is amazing. 
And I can imagine it kind of like in one of those scenarios where the the character in the movie isn't really paying attention to what's happening and he kind of stumbles in and blurts out something. I can see this amazing moment, this transfiguration moment, bright and shining, glowing Jesus who doesn't look like Jesus anymore and these other two figures and Peter kind of stumbles in and goes, hey, you know what? We should just make some monuments right here and, and make this moment beautiful. And God says, uh, maybe not. Clouds roll in, covering everything in darkness and a loud voice, which is normally how God shows up, clouds and then a loud voice. (laughs) This is my son who I have chosen, right? So why on earth would we go to 2 Corinthians? If that's the story, we are to be remembering today, why would, what, what's this Second Corinthians thing have to talk about? Number one, Paul wasn't there, was he? It was Peter, James, and John. Now, I don't know if it's because Paul had a conversation with Peter about it, or if it's God and the Holy Spirit revealing to Paul what happens to us when we believe. But Paul is very aware that when we believe in Christ, a transformation happens, and he likens it to a veil being removed from our eyes. How many of you ladies have been married, and you had to wear a veil? Right? It's not a blindfold, is it? No. It doesn't keep you from seeing everything. It's kind of just, it just makes things harder to see, right? Kind of kind of hides things without hiding, right? And so what happens in the way Paul likens this in the story is that whenever someone turns to the Lord, verses 16 through 18, whenever someone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. So it's like, you know, when you're in that marriage moment, you take the veil off, right? Sight is made clear. And he says, for the Lord is the Spirit, and wherever the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Freedom to see things more clearly, right? So all of us who have had that veil removed can see and reflect the glory of the Lord. Right? Peter, James, and John. Peter, mostly, because he's the one that woke up. He got to see without a veiled vision what the glory of the Lord looked like. And the Lord, who is the Spirit, makes us more and more like him as we are changed into that glorious image. Are we being changed into that glorious image? How do we get there? How many of you remember or know, probably some of you are fans of The Wizard of Oz? Right? You know where this is going probably, right? The story is, is, is about redemption. It's about finding that thing within you that you was already there, but having to have somebody else remove the veil for you to see it. Right? I can't, I'm totally drawing a blank on her name. <laughs> Dorothy. I kept wanting to say Judy, but that's her real name. <laughs> that comes later. Anyway, Dorothy... <laughs> Dorothy and Toto find themselves caught up in a tornado. They wake up. They're in a strange land, right? Nothing like this she's used to in Kansas, right? Toto, we're not in Kansas anymore. This is weird. And so all she wants to do is get back home. So in order to get back home, she has to make this journey and travel down the yellow brick road to find the wizard. The wizard is going to have all the answers and get her back home, right? On the way, she runs into people from her life, obviously not her life in, the real, in this world, but in the real world, and they represent things to her. The, the scarecrow, he doesn't feel like he's very smart. He wants some brains, right? They run into the tin man. The tin man, he doesn't feel like he has it in him to do anything, and he needs heart. And then they run into the lion, who is... A coward, fearful, and boy, he could really use some courage, right? 
And so they all join each other and continue to join forces all the way to, to Oz where they finally meet the wizard. What a moment, right? Without the green face, I, I, I'm picturing Peter on this mountain, this green, maybe not green smoke, just black, billowy smoke and the voice of, of God, right? Instead, they're in front of this green face, the wizard, fire and smoke. And he tells them that if they want these things, they have to perform a mission for him, right? Basically, they have to get rid of a nemesis of his in order to, to get what they need. So they, uh, they go and they do it, right? We're deeds-based. Moses, the law of Moses, right? If you follow these rules, you'll get to heaven. See, you're kind of following me on the correlation here? So they go and they do it and they come back and they're before the, the wizard. Yes, we did it. And the wizard says, no, you can't have it, no. Thank goodness Toto was there is all I can say, right? They would have probably just turned around and left. Well, this stinks. Instead, Toto runs over and pulls open the curtain. Toto removes the veil, and behind the veil is just a regular guy who's pulling the levers and pushing the buttons and speaking into the voice thing, right? Never once did this guy really ever have the power to give them what they needed. However, once the veil is removed, they know how to get or have unlocked the things that they needed. Right? The scarecrow found out that he was actually pretty smart, but he had convinced himself, thanks to the veil, that he wasn't very smart. The tin man realized that he did have heart, but with the veil covering his eyes, he really didn't believe in himself. And the cowardly lion was still a lion. He had the courage within him all along, but once the veil is removed, he finally gets to see what he was made for. And Dorothy? Yeah, she had a pair of shoes on that would have gotten her there every, the whole time. Right? When the veil is lifted in our lives, we get an opportunity to see ourselves as God sees us. And not only that, but we get to see Jesus for who he really is. Glorified. Amazing. Jesus calls Peter, John, and James to the mountain. And I don't believe he's calling them there with an attempt to scare them. Right? He's not trying to be the Wizard of Oz. He's trying to give them a glimpse of the future that can be if they will allow themselves to see it. He's trying to pull the curtain back. <laughs> right? Like, hey, come check this out. You think it's cool when I make the lame walk and the blind see? Wait till you see this. I find it interesting that this moment in which God speaks to Peter, this is my son, my chosen one, listen to him. It is so powerful and so impactful that Paul is later giving a similar message to the church in Corinth without ever actually being the one that was there. Right? Were you and I, were, were you guys on the mountain with Jesus? And saw him transformed and heard God's voice? Did you, were you there for that? I don't think Paul was either. Does that lessen the impact of what Paul can tell the church in Corinth? Not really. In verse 14, he says, But the people's minds were hardened, and to this day, whenever the old covenant is being read, the same veil covers their minds so they can't understand the truth. And this veil can be removed only by believing in Christ. If you want the secret of Transfiguration Sunday, it's for the simple fact that the veil can be removed. You can be Peter, James, or John. You can be in the moment where you see the truth in a revealed, transformed Jesus. 
This transfiguration was always intended for us to later read it and understand that the Spirit of God is with us and with it this veil is gone and we have an opportunity to see God for who He truly is. However, we are usually just like the cowardly lion. We're just like the scarecrow. We're just like the tin man. We're going to believe the lies that the world tells us about ourselves. We're going to believe the hype and the propaganda that we see on on screen in front of us day after day. And we are going to forget that there is truth, triumph, and power in the risen Jesus. The glorious new form of Jesus isn't intended to make us feel scared or unworthy. We are absolutely unworthy of it. It's meant to give us a realization that we can strive to see and be in relationship with this glorious Jesus, not because of our goodness, not because of the things that we think we have to do to earn it, but because it's already inside of us from the first place. We have to unlock it. Wednesday's going to start the season of Lent. You have a a guided, directed, focused time to start thinking about this God and who He is. What is it if God was, let's say the risen Jesus was the Wizard of Oz, what's your journey going to be about? What is it that you want to receive from God? Maybe a, a greater understanding of who He is, right? That's a great Sunday school answer. Maybe it's a a deeper relationship with God. You might even be so go go so far enough to say that I want a deeper relationship with God so that I can have a deeper relationship with other people. Maybe we are holding on to unforgiveness in somewhere and some aspect of our life, and we are not allowing ourselves to see the glory of God. How can we maybe repent from things in our life? so that our hearts will be ready to dive into that relationship and see Him as He really is. Loving, caring, giving, serving, forgiving. How can we let our guard down long enough in the 40 days coming ahead so that we can see the God that we think is behind the curtain? A God who really just wants nothing but our full attention. Amen. Join me in praying over our offering this morning. We still put it in the box. There's still PayPal. You can reach on the website. However you want to do that. Even your time and your energy. Those are all part of the offering, right? Father in heaven, our offering is more than uh, dropping money in a box. Our offering is what we do in response to hearing your word. And so God, this morning we give back to you whatever we can. Our money, our time, our energy, our talents, and our gifts. We provide it back to you. It's already yours anyway. That you might take it, multiply it, and make it grow as you see fit. So our community, the people that we love, will see you and know how much you love them. We pray this in the name of your Son, Jesus, who makes it possible with the strength and guidance of your Holy Spirit that's here with us now. Amen. If you are able to stand and join us today, we are going to close with the hymn, Amazing Grace. And so I hope that this is part of your story and maybe where it begins.
And so I leave you this morning with the words of Reverend Robert Johnson, the February 14th, 1999 Episcopal speaker. And he says, the church calls this event the transfiguration of Christ. Jesus was transfigured. The figure, the image, the look he had, the face that he showed others was changed. The appearance of his face changed, and Jesus had a different look. Transfigurations are big business today, right? I don't know anybody who doesn't want one. Many people will work to alter their face to their advantage if they can. Sometimes, though, a change is not just in looks, but it's a whole image, including a name. Isser Danielovich Densky. Well, he didn't like that name, and he became Kirk Douglas. In the same way, Francis Gum transfigured herself and her image into Judy Garland. Archibald Leach became Cary Grant. Aaron Schwalt became Red Buttons. And would you have paid money to see a movie uh, with Marion Morrison in it? But Marion didn't want to take that chance, and he became John Wayne. Long after Peter was in the presence of Jesus, he would fail time and time again. But Jesus, who always called him the rock, saw what no one else saw, and that's exactly what Peter became. What is it God is calling you to be transfigured into? Amen. Have a great and blessed week.